Hello, everyone. I'd like to welcome you. How are you doing? Um, first, I'd like to do a little bit of an introduction to myself. Um, I'm Kristen King. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Tennessee in Knoxville. And my specialty is traumatic brain injury. I, do, um, I teach courses and do research in that. And my background, I actually have 14 years as a clinical speech pathologist working in level one trauma centers. I'm working with people with brain injury. And today I'm going to be speaking on the treatment of cognitive disorders following TBI and talking about what's currently being done and some future perspectives and what um, is being proposed in the area of brain injury. I'd like to start out, though, giving you a little bit of an idea of brain injury um, and the perspective of what we're looking at when we talk about cognition. You're going to find a few of these slides aren't in your PowerPoint. Um, they're just because it's a random picture and doesn't really give you anything at, um, to look at. But if you look at the screen, you'll notice that there's a number of circles. And just kind of look at which ones are concave and which ones are convex. When I flip the picture, do you see any difference? They reverse. And I should like to use this in order to give you the idea that with cognitive deficits, oftentimes what the patient is seeing or the person that you're working with doesn't have the same perspective that we have on it. Um, and so uh, their attention, how they attend and how they remember things uh, will affect and influence the responses they give. So we have to kind of keep that in mind as we work with them. So today, we're going to actually be talking about the various indicators of the deficits of attention and memory, processing speed, and language at all severity levels of brain injury. And I hope that you'll go away with an understanding of the hierarchy of treatment protocols for rehabilitation of both cognitive and language deficits following brain injury. And you'll even be able to verbalize and maybe demonstrate some of the treatment techniques for various cognitive and language deficits. It's interesting and important to know that traumatic brain injury is the most misunderstood, misdiagnosed, and underfunded public health problem our nation faces. Um, this is from Susan Connors, president of the Brain Injury Association of America, 2010. And it's considered to be a silent epidemic or an invisible disability. Brain injuries are often unnoticed or misdiagnosed because the patient is walking and talking, looks okay, they go home, and then they find they have problems. Um, we also may not have conclusive measures in medical facilities. They see them, they give them a really quick mini mental status exam or something. They have to spell world backward, um, count backwards from 100 by threes, and they're able to do simple tasks. But when they return home, they start breaking down when they get back to work and trying to multitask in their everyday life. So they look the same, they talk the same, and they're often told they're going to be fine. Some myths about brain injury. We hear they don't look brain injured. The brain should be healed by now. It was just a bump on the head. The head um, has to contact with something for there to be a brain injury. Now, these are the myths. Keep that in mind. Um, some examples of where that's not true. Shaken baby syndrome. Seat belts. You know, when we have seat belts in cars and our head doesn't actually contact anything, but we do still um, suffer a brain injury. Airbag deployment um, can cause impact with the face and injuries. There has to be a loss of consciousness for there to be a brain injury. That is a huge myth that we're trying to get rid of. There does not need to be a loss of consciousness. All the way back to Phineas Gage, and they you know, had a steel pipe through his head, never lost consciousness. Um, gunshot wound victims often do not lose consciousness. There's also the myth that there has to be a change in the CT scan or the MRI results and for there to be a brain injury. And we know with mild traumatic brain injury, there's no change in the CT or MRI. So we, these are myths that we're trying to um, get rid of. <clears throat> Excuse me. An acquired brain injury is any injury to the brain occurring after birth. Now, for the purposes of this talk, I'm focusing primarily on traumatic brain injury, what you see in the pink box. These are injuries that are caused by an external force. But I don't want to leave out or, or get, or eliminate the idea that you have acquired brain injury, where these are such things as oxygen deprivation, anoxic injury, infectious disease, chemical or substance abuse exposure, strokes, tumors. All of these can cause um, a, an acquired brain injury and cause deficits in cognition that we still have to address. So who experiences brain injury? Well, anyone can get a brain injury, yet some are at more risk than others. We know that the highest risk 
um, what we've been able to find with research is zero to four years of age, 15 to 24, and 75 years of, and older. Um, got a guess on why those are our age ranges? Zero to four would be our toddlers and just starting to walk and falling. 15 to 24 year olds, we have our teenagers who are at high risk and starting to drive in the early stages of driving. And then 75 years and older, it's a fall risk again. Males are 2.5 times more likely than females to experience a brain injury. And this is, equa this is um, equated to the fact that they have a higher risk lifestyle, contact sports, they're more aggressive in some of their um, activities and behaviors, and so they're just a little bit more at risk. And then also individuals who have, who have sustained one or more concussions. The more, um, once they have one concussion, they're more at risk for a second and then more at risk for additional concussions.